want to start with with the personal favorite, which is why do you do what you do and how did you get there? And I guess a little bit of a story of your background as well, like uh, just just the story of where you grew up and and how did it you know how did it all connect? Yeah, so we, we should start with the end point. So I ended up today. I'm a professor of computer science and I'm a writer. I've written four books. Um, and if you want to understand how I've ended up doing both things, I think you have to go back to my high school years. Um, This was in the late 1990s, living in New Jersey, and it was the first dot-com boom, sort of one of the first times in history where teenagers, for example, were suddenly holding sway in the market and were becoming multimillionaires. And I started a company back in that first dot-com boom, and that exposed me to the sort of world of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship books. And when I arrived at college and started studying computer science on my track to become eventually a professor, I went looking for books for my student life that were similar to the types of books I had read uh, while an entrepreneur, and I couldn't find them. You couldn't find those type of books on the bookshelf back then, so that gave me the idea to write my own, and that's what started me on the writing side of my career. I began writing the books that I wanted to read on my own sort of path to become an academic, and that's what gave me this sort of parallel life as a writer and a academic at the same time. No, so the, I guess the follow-up question is, you know, what were the inspiration or uh, what was the inspiration or influence at this point uh, to write those books, right? I'm not used to, maybe it's my Indian background, but I'm not used to sort of university students writing a bunch of books and, and you'd written probably three by the time you graduated and then started a company. So, so you know, if you could talk me through a little bit about the time, uh, about that period. Yeah, let me give you a, a more precise timeline. Um, so I started college in the fall of the year 2000. The, I started my company probably in 98, 1998. Um, when I went to college, I wound it down so I could focus on my college experience. And I had wound it down by that first winter, right? That's 2001, which also happened to be the first dot-com crash happened in the spring of 2001. So uh, then I was at school at a Dartmouth College. I was studying computer science. Uh, I was writing as well. I wanted to know what to do after I had finished my business, and I started writing for various publications. It was in my junior year of college that I began working on the project that became my first book, How to Win at College. Um, And the the inspiration for that, again, I was surrounded by these entrepreneurs. It was a time when people in their teenage years were emboldened and felt uh, empowered to actually take on things that just five years earlier that no one our age would ever do. And basically, an entrepreneur friend, I believe it was... um, Josh Newman, the entrepreneur over drinks at the Russian Sam's Bar in Manhattan, heard my idea for a book offhand and said, well, just go write it. Stop talking about it. And that's the type of way we spoke back then. We just sort of felt anything was possible. I said, OK, I will. And I signed with my agent that June and uh, wrote the book that following fall. This was the fall of my senior year. And so my first book was submitted uh, about halfway through my senior year of college. And then I wrote two more books while in graduate school after that. And my fourth book actually, um, while a postdoctoral associate after graduate school. So that's the timeline. So, so, so the next one is, is so good. They cannot ignore you. Right. And that's for me, the, the subject of the, of the next 15 minutes or so, uh, you know, I, I, I've loved the book so much, as I've told you, I've gifted it to 10 people. It's a book I recommend to anybody out there who's looking for career advice. Uh, and it's fascinating because, you know, you're still 31, right? And, and that's, that's, that's pretty young. Uh, how, did you, how did you, you know, go through this and, and develop this thesis on, on careers and, and in a way life uh, and, and excellence? So could you talk me through your journey on, on, on that one? Right. So for... Most of my books, the, the, the pattern has been I write the book that I, I need at the time. I write the book I want to read. So they're rarely me saying, let me share my years of experience. It's mainly they're usually of a sort of a story type structure. Hey, I'm at a point in my life where I need this advice. So I set out there systematically to research it, and here's what I found. And So Good They Can't Ignore You was no different. It was at the sort of big career transition. I was about to enter the academic job market, and I wanted to understand How do people end up loving what they do? I thought this was the time in my life I needed an answer to that question. So I set out on this sort of year-long journey to go out and meet people who love what they do, to read the research literature surrounding workplace satisfaction and answer that question. And the two surprising things I found was that, one, follow your passion. The most common piece of career advice our generation has been given is actually bad advice if your goal is to end up passionate about what you do. 
for most people, it will actually probably actively hold you back from ending up passionate about what you do. And the reason is most people don't have ingrained passions that they can identify and follow. And also becoming passionate about your work is way more complicated than simply matching into a pre-existing interest. So that was the first thing I found in this research. And the second thing I found is that skills are everything. People who love what they do didn't know that this was their one true calling early on, but what they did do consistently was build up rare and valuable skills, which was the leverage they needed to craft a type of remarkable career that can give you real passion for your livelihood. Okay, so now now we get into a couple of sort of meaty topics, right? One of the topics you've written about from time to time is this concept called deep work. Uh, could you could you talk me through that? And, 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 you know, the related concept is, I think, is one you've been thinking about off late, which is on the concept of bursts. So, I, you know, I'd, I'd love your 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 sense and, and your view on both of these. And then I have a couple of questions on that. So deep work at a high level is the ability to sort of focus persistently on something that is cognitively demanding even when it's straining and even when it's past the point of flow or being enjoyable. It's basically the, the, the core work of stretching your ability, the core work of wringing as much value as possible out of your current cognitive abilities. It's what a mathematician does, for example, when they're trying to solve a proof. Now, I think deep work is more important now than it's ever been because we're entering this world of knowledge work and big data and complex analysis where the ability to concentrate uh, with great focus on cognitively demanding tasks is now incredibly valuable. But this change in the economy is happening at the exact same time that our technology is distracting us more and more. So we are losing at an incredibly rapid rate our ability to do cognitively demanding tasks. If we go back 300 years, you read the biographies of the founding fathers, you read Lincoln's biography. This notion that you would sit down and read a book in Latin that was hard for four hours was just what you did if you were a student. Yeah. Today, a student has a hard time going more than 15 minutes on a basic assignment without looking for distraction. So deep work, I think, is a, a skill that is endangered at exactly the time in which it is most valuable. And for the small number of people who recognize this and train their ability to do so can become elite in our current economy. So, you know, related to this is this um, is the idea of bursts. Um, and, and I think you've been talking about the impact of, of, of bursts versus busyness. So could you share your, your view on that first? And then, and then I had a couple of questions on whether, uh, you know, you, whether I, I was just wondering if it's more relevant to academia versus, versus the outside. And, and again, there were more questions and musings at this point. Yeah, so deep work fascinates me. Um, so I've been studying it. I think it's an art form, and I've been talking to and trying to study people who are good at it in different fields and trying to understand its rhythms and its patterns. And, and one of the, the patterns I've found is that um, deep work often happens in burst. Uh, you know, I, I wrote about this recently. I talked to a hotshot professor who was at his institutions, I think the, the youngest person to ever get tenure, a very august institution in his department. And I asked him, how is he so productive? How does he write six to seven top papers a year? And he said he works in burst. If he's going to write a draft of a paper, he takes three days and does nothing else but write the draft of the paper and then steps away from it for a week. Right? He works in intense burst, and in between bursts, then if he's not doing that, then he's doing email or whatever else he needs to do. Um, something else I noticed, though, is if you – need to work in burst, that means you have to have a schedule with the possibility of taking huge amounts of time and dedicating it to those bursts, which means you can't be overwhelmed with urgent, small, non-deep work tasks, tons of projects and irons in the fires and email and all this sort of social networking. If you have all this stuff filling your day, you don't have the ability to just drop everything and spend three days doing burst. So something I've noticed with people who are very successful at doing deep work is that they often have downtime in their schedule because they have to constrain the administrative and the logistics and the minutia in their schedule so that they have room for deep work when it's time to do deep work. But in the time where they're not deep working, that becomes just open time for them. So if you actually study people who do remarkable things, you see this rhythm of them having downtime and then intensity, downtime and then intensity, which is much different than the sort of busy with lots of sort of fun and accomplishable and, and, and not too value producing things that we see mainly in today's world. 
So, so that you know that aligns with a couple of thoughts, right? One is you know there's this famous story of Warren Buffett's diary being completely empty, uh, which 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 I think probably aligns very well with what you're saying. But I I think I think the question that came to mind is often right, especially as businesses, you often have to look at a lot of things as drip. You know, something you do probably consistently say it's a say it's a notification to a customer or an update. Uh, you know, I look at a lot of tasks as something that you do pretty much every day. Uh, you know, just because almost almost a cycle of habit. Um, so so how does how does burst tie into this this concept of drip? Uh, you know, say marketing is best done in drip, right? It's not done in burst. So do you do you get all your ideas in burst and then make sure it gets dripped out? You know, how do these two things tie in? And I think I think that was what I was trying to reconcile in my head. Yeah, I think well, I mean, it's a good point, and I think that drip activities um, are necessary. Uh, but they're also not going to produce remarkability. That's my, my way of thinking. It, that most things that are produced that are remarkable usually come out of sort of remarkable applications of effort, right? Because it's a, it's a marketplace of ideas and products and, and thoughts. And it takes sort of uh, everything you have to break out of there. So drip activities are important, but, uh, you know, I, especially for people in my position, see them not almost adversarially, right? It's something to be systematized. It's something to be uh, batched. It's something to be Tim Ferriss assigned, right? I mean, you, okay, it's good to have this type of interaction with your client. How can you automate that? How can you minimize the time it takes from you? How can you make sure that these don't take up all of your time of the day and prevent you from mastering the sort of new system, mastering the new, you know, cutting edge database development platform that's going to allow you to bring the product to the new level and let you sort of see and have the idea that's going to be the future of your company. So we have drips, but we shouldn't let our life be one dominated by drips. So here's here's another question, right? Here's something I struggle with. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what my so so I, I guess the nice thing about in your case, right? You're you're gonna become a professor, uh, or you are a professor in computer science. So it's fairly clear as to where your deep work lies. But for for somebody like me, right? I'm three years into my career. I'm not sure what the rest of the path will be. And I think as we figure out in So Good They Cannot Ignore You, it, it, it's probably going to be uh, you know, only revealed to me once I get there. So, so what's the focus? The, is the focus to be so good uh, at whatever you do now and then, and then hope opportunities open up? Or, or is it much more you know, step back, think about what you want to be, you know, what you want to be good at 10 years from now? H- how does this process work is, is my point, right? Is it, is it kind of uh, top heavy where you do all the thinking up front and then you do all the thinking up front? Or is it something that you just figured out as you went, as you go forward? What, what was your view from everybody you interviewed? Yeah, this is this is the big question. I mean, I think the, the, the linchpin of this sort of deep work, deliberately build your skill approach is figuring out where to put your effort. So I'm in the bad situation because in academia, it's one of the rare industries uh, where that's very clear. It's very clear what's valuable. It's where is your paper published in a good place and is it being cited? And because of that, it's very, very difficult uh, to stand out because everyone knows the rules. It's like trying to become a good golfer. People know how to practice for golf, and it's really there's no shortcut, right? Um, but I think this is the huge untapped possibility in other types of work, other types of knowledge work, where it's not so clear what's valuable and what you should build up, that if you can figure out the sort of hidden patterns of what is valuable at your company and in your field and in your industry, right, uh, and figure out what are the key skills to grow, then I think you can get results much faster than if you're, say, a basketball player and say, ah, I need my jump shot to be better, because everyone knows that and everyone's practicing that. But if you're a consultant, most people are just trying to show up and work hard and impress their boss, and huge parts of your effort might be sort of scattershot and wasted. If you're able to say, hey, this particular skill, which would be very hard to master, but if I mastered this over the next six months, would give me a huge boost in value. If you're thinking that way, you could really shoot ahead of the pack. So, of course, how do you do that? Well, I think this is a big question. It's something I'm working on now. I'm actually about to launch a pilot program with my friend Scott Young, where we're systematically exploring this with a group of 100 different people in 100 different fields. We're trying to figure out how can you simulate in your own working life a coach, someone who knows your field and can tell you this is what you need to master, then you're going to do this, and then you need to work on this project. We're trying to understand the practices for breaking down and researching your own field 
simulating a coach in essence, figuring out this is what's important for what I'm trying to do. Here's the projects I need to run. Here's how I tell if they're successful. Here's where my deep work should go. That is the whole ball game in applying this to knowledge work. And it's, it's at the center of my attention right now as a writer and thinker. You know, that makes sense, right? So, so you know, after after you did, uh, after we read through So Good They Cannot Ignore You, right? So I had all my friends read it. Uh, and, and then we, you know, we sat together for, for a bit of a brainstorm around what this means. Uh, and I think one of the cool, one of the insights we got out of discussing how can we apply deliberate practice as a concept to our life, uh, right, was, was the key is the coach, right? If you look at the four elements of deliberate practice, it is, uh, you know, yes, yeah, specifically designed uh, by a coach. Um, you know, it's repeatable, it's painful, uh, and gives you instant feedback. Now, you can get repeatable, painful, and instant feedback by just hitting golf balls, right? It doesn't mean you're getting any better. So, so no, that makes absolute sense. The question then is, um, let's, let's think about, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people who are going through their career right now, um, no coach, uh, and not even sure, um, I guess, of whether this is it in the sense that is this job it? Am I going to be, say, an advertising, consul- uh, you know, advertising guy all through my life or am I, am I looking to change? You know, so where do you get this perspective? I, I, it seems like you get this perspective by interviewing a lot of people or at least speaking to a lot of people. Uh, is that where you get your perspective or is it from reading? W- 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 what do you typically recommend your students when they come to you trying to figure out if they want to be, uh, you know, a computer scientist or, or go work at Google? Yeah, well, I, I, let me... Well, let me answer two questions. There. The first, the first thing I would say is, um, it's important to try to leave this mindset that the specific job you have is somehow what's really important. Fair enough. That uh, your your satisfaction in a career is going to come from the particular jobs. That is a dangerous mindset. This notion is this the job that's going to make me happy, or will another job make me happy? Jobs don't make people happy by themselves. What makes people really enjoy their career is once they've built up rare and valuable skills and they use it, and they use it as leverage, and they take control of their working life, and they gain the type of traits in their working life that matter. So a job, in some sense, is someone paying you to develop rare and valuable skills that you'll use as your leverage. So you should never be worried about, is this my job or not my job? You should be worried about what rare and valuable skills am I building? How rare and valuable are they now? How am I going to make them more rare and valuable? And then how am I going to use them as leverage? The particular office you're in, the particular job you're in, in some sense, is not that important. What matters is, do I have this leverage in my career? Now, how do you figure out what skills to develop? How do you figure out where to put your attention? Again, I think this is the big question, and I'm, I'm sort of working on more detailed answers to this. But I think at a high level, an easy way to do this, or at least to get started, find the people in your field whose career path resonate with you. Try to figure out what they're doing that other people aren't, right? Do a little differential analysis here. What is it that's making them have this arc that resonates with you while there's so many other people who've been in the business just as long who, who don't? And once you've identified, oh, they do these key things or they did these key things, now you have your targets. Okay, how, how can I build those? The re, because, let's, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're a computer programmer and the, the person that resonates with you is this hot shot programmer who's sort of bounces in and out of places like Google and otherwise works remotely from a cab in uh, Lake Tahoe and just sort of like that autonomy and respect or something, you would say, well, what does he do that other programmers don't? Why can't he live that lifestyle? And you'd probably find, ah, he's just fantastic at C Sharp and is a guru at it and just has this instinct for it or something, right? Well, now you have an objective target. Ah, if I can build up a, a black belt systematically in a way that no one else is doing, everyone else is just taking their assignments and sort of doing them, how can I systematically spend two hours a day every other day? What can I do deliberately to build up that skill? Now you're off to the races. I guess final couple of uh, couple of sort of career-related uh, questions, right? One of them is, is very much around um, incentives. A, a lot of people, and this, is, this happens to students when they graduate, right? I saw it when, when we all graduated. Um, you know, you have a lot of these incentives like money and travel and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm almost of the view that these things interfere with uh, with excellence. Like I, I think if anything, if, if money and travel are byproducts of a good products uh, rather than anything else, has your experience been similar or or have your has your experience been that these are indications that you're doing well, et cetera, et cetera. Like, I, I, I almost find I, I, often that it interferes with the goal of just getting incredibly good. Um, what is your view on, on, on all sort of the bells and whistles around uh, around what you do? Yeah, I think you're right in the sense that if you consistently want good bells and whistles, that's valuable. That's rare. Most people don't have that. So if you want great bells and whistles, then you need something rare and valuable to offer in return. That's supply and demand. A college degree is 
not rare and valuable by itself, right? So don't come out of school saying, hey, I want a job that right away is going to give me everything I want. You should say, ah, I want to get these rare and valuable traits, these bells and whistles. Uh, great. Where is your rare and valuable skill to offer in return? Well, you don't have it. You have to start building it. But you have to see your career in this sort of economic sense. The traits that are going to make you love your career, be it something intangible like autonomy or a sense of respect, or be it something more bells and whistly, like you travel business class and get to go to conferences and, and talk with big minds, whatever it is that resonates with you, it's probably rare and valuable. And if you want it, just like if you want a rare and valuable car or a house on the beach in California, you have to have something to offer in return. It's, it's supply and demand, and that's going to be your skill in the knowledge work economy, and that's going to have to be built up systematically and deliberately. So I agree, especially early in your career, don't get caught up in what does my job offer me. You should always be asking, what am I offering the world? And if it's not much yet, how do I increase it as fast as possible? Yeah, no, makes uh, resonates hundred percent. So here's a question: Somebody who read the book asked me, right? They said, they said, you know, you advocate autonomy. Does that mean, uh, you know, you're saying, look, don't go for the, don't go through the corporate career path. Instead, you know, as soon as you figure out what your rare and valuable skills are, get out, do something small on your own. Uh, at least that, that was that was sort of the interpretation question. Was that what you had in mind? What was what, what, what you know? What is the thesis on on autonomy? Yeah, autonomy was uh, one of several traits I found that were common in people who love what they do for a living. So it doesn't mean that everyone who loves what they do for a living has a lot of autonomy, but it was something that came up often when you study people who do love what they do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you're in a non-corporate world, but it means that you're such a star in your corporate world, perhaps, that you really have a say of what projects you work on, when you work on them, who you work on them with. You don't have much oversight. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you drop everything and go start a business, um, though it could. But the, the sort of bigger observation here is having a say over what you do, when you do it, and how you do it is an incredible source of passion. It's one of the many complex traits that leads someone to love what they do. And this is an idea I come back to again and again. Loving what you do does not just come from a simple match of your job to some sort of pre-existing, innate, hardwired inclination. That's the smallest piece of ending up loving what you do. There's so many other things that go into this mix of loving your work, and autonomy is often one piece of that mix. You have to gain control over your working life. doesn't mean you have to leave a company, but it means you have to have a lot of leverage, and leverage requires rare and valuable skills. Great. Final couple of questions. I think uh, final two. The, the second last one is, how do you apply all of these in your life? And I think I think the, the concurrent question with that is, uh, what are little hacks or productivity boosts that, that you use in your schedule to keep yourself productive? Yeah, well, at the, at the high level... Um, you know, my, my whole working life is built around these notions of deliberate practice, sort of clearly identifying uh, what are the sort of key metrics I'm going for and what type of projects are to get me there. And then how am I doing on the project? Uh, my schedule is built around bursts of deep work. Um, I, I try to work on important projects. I try to work deeply. Uh, a lot of little hacks on the productivity side help make that possible. I mean, a lot of things. For example, I spend a, an hour every morning very efficiently processing my list and sort of handling small tasks. That clears up a lot of my days. I teach twice a week. I've systematized my classes to the point that I can take the two days I teach and say, these are teaching days, and everything relevant to my courses gets done in those two days. So it leaves three other days open for the possibility of large, deep work. I try to eliminate regular meetings, for example. I don't find this that useful to have weekly meetings when you're working on a project. I think having uh, clear goals that you meet back once you've met them makes a lot more sense. It sort of matches the birth structure. I use David Allen's full capture to keep track of my tasks. I'm uh, hard to get in touch with. I've never had a Facebook account. I've never had a Twitter account. This is my doing this interview is the first time I've been on a Google Plus thing, right? Because I, I'm trying to not be distracted, keep my ability to focus. So I have a sort of a ton of little hacks that are I'm always revolving, you know, evolving and are revolving through my life, but they all aim at the same thing. Keep my schedule as unencumbered as possible so that I have the possibility to work deeply uh, often. Not all the time, but I have the possibility to work deep when I need to work deep and build up and accrue a lot of these deep work hours because ultimately I see it as the only thing that matters. I know I have other logistical tasks I have to do and I get them done, but I don't see them as the same way I see the ability to work deeply on hard problems and the things that really produce value. Fantastic. So final question. Uh, what is an idea that, that inspires you that you would like to share? An idea that uh, inspires me that I'd like to share. That's a, 
That is, uh, that's an interesting question. I think that's a good question. What is an idea that inspires um, me that I'd like uh, to share? Well, I mean, I think I think there's a couple ideas that have played an inspiring role, you know, um, in my life. I think one thing that's been very uh, sort of inspiring to me is this notion that um, ultimately it's sort of your actions that matter. Uh, this this notion that you define yourself as sort of a human through through what you what you do um and you know you have good times and you have bad times and you have things go well and you have things sometimes don't go well and sometimes you're sick and sometimes you're not and you know all this stuff comes and goes but ultimately the point is that doesn't really matter that's just part of your life experience what you control is sort of the actions you do what you do and this notion that you sort of uh define yourself and your impact on the world through that just I find inspiring. I think that gives you a sense of real resilience. Uh, you stop worrying and looking over your shoulder so much about, oh, what if this bad thing happens or that bad thing happens? And uh, people I admire seem to embody that, and I'm trying my best to try to get better at that type of mindset um, to sort of living a, a sort of good, meaningful life. 